Good morning. I'm Sam Agresti. I'm with the uh, Brady Ware Dealership Services Group. And uh, on behalf of the whole team, I want to welcome everyone today to uh, our, our dealership services conference. Um, we have a pretty good agenda um, this morning. Going to cover some good things highlighted by and Jim Ziegler, who seems to always have his fingers on the pulse of the industry. So it should be always pretty interesting and hope we learn a lot. Um, we're going to kick off the morning with. Um, with um, Randy, who's going to talk a little bit about internal controls, and then Tom with a little bit of some of the safeguard measures that we do here at Brady Ware, and then um, uh, then Jim's going to uh, touch base with some of the stuff on internet marketing and some other things he um, on the industry. Uh, as Sam said, uh, I'm going to kick off talking just a little bit about internal controls and and some of the different fraud areas that, that I've experienced in some of the, the work that I've done as a certified fraud examiner. I'm on the dealership services team. I'm a CPA, but I'm also a CFE. And so I've had the opportunity to go out and, and actually work with some different dealers to help improve internal controls within the dealership. And then also, I've had the unfortunate uh, uh, opportunity to work with some of them who've, who have had fraud occur within their dealerships. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, about, little bit about that and, and just briefly touch on some of the different areas uh, that, that I think maybe you've got some risk and, and some different things uh, to be looking for. So uh, again, I'm going to talk a little focus mainly on uh, employee fraud. I mean, there's different facets of fraud that can occur within the dealership. Uh, you have several business units within a dealership between F&I, new car sales, used car sales, uh, service, parts. You have all these different business units within uh, one roof. And so you've got you know, several different types of risk uh, that are you know, potential fraud areas that could occur within the dealership. Uh, last uh, busy season, uh, we had done a, a white paper uh, project and and we uh, did a study uh, with a uh, a group that did a research of a of hundred dealers and they went out and did a survey and one of the questions on the survey uh, that we sent out and, and we published these results on our website was uh, as far as you uh, you're aware have you experienced fraud or attempted fraud within your dealership and uh, more than one third 38 percent of the respondents uh, have experienced actual or attempted fraud more than half, 51%, have either experienced fraud themselves or heard about a specific fraud at another dealership. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that it's, it's really unknowable, uh, the number of the remaining respondents that have experienced fraud and just don't know it yet. And, and that's the thing a lot of times uh, when it happens and, and all the different cases that I've been involved with, completely unexpected. And, and so uh, that's you know, kind of one of the unknowns there. Uh, one of the other questions we threw out there when we did the survey was, was fraud attempted or committed by an employee or somebody outside the dealership? Almost two-thirds, 62% uh, of respondents familiar with fraud indicated that the fraud came from within either an employee acting alone or in concert with an outsider, which, again, is a little bit scary, and that's why I'm kind of focusing on just a little bit of some of the employee fraud this morning. Uh, what type of fraud was attempted or committed? 30% uh, identity theft, 44% embezzlement, and then 26% was just uh, outright theft or robbery. Um, majority of the employee-generated fraud involved embezzlement, including uh, involving the manipulation of the dealership's financial system. Uh, outsider loan fraud usually involved outright property theft or identity theft of some sort. Almost three quarters, 74% of the specific fraud cases mentioned by the survey respondents identity theft of an, and embezzlement might have been prevented with stronger internal controls. So uh, one of the organizations as a certified fraud examiner that I'm involved with is the ACFE, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. And about every two years, they do a study. And, and they go out and, and they survey uh, like a 1,000 different companies uh, who've experienced fraud. And I have summarized just some of the results up here on the screen uh, that came as a result of that survey. Uh, First thing there, survey participants estimated that the typical organization loses about 5% of revenue each year to fraud. Uh, if you kind of quantify that uh, with the 2013 estimated gross world product, and again, this is obviously an estimate, about 3.7 trillion potential loss as a result of fraud worldwide. Uh, the median loss by fraud was about $145,000, and, and that's a median over you know, about 1,000 different uh, respondents that, that responded to, to this particular survey. So you've got some that were much larger, some that are lower, but, but the middle was about $145,000. Um, I have up there, the smaller organizations tend to suffer disproportionately larger losses. And when I say smaller organizations, that's all you guys. Um, 
the large organizations that they, uh, they got to respond to this are some of the public companies that have very good internal controls. They've, you know, they've got, uh, you know, big four auditors coming in and, and looking at their, their work at the end of the year, and, and they specifically have work done with regards to their internal controls. Most smaller companies really don't have a lot of internal controls. A lot of times they might have one or two people that are, you know, doing different jobs within their organizations which by in and of itself leave you more susceptible to potential fraud occurring. Um, uh, seven primary departments uh, out of the survey where losses occurred uh, were accounting, operations, sales, executive and upper management, customer service, purchasing, and finance. And, and obviously some of these frauds are probably a little bit easier to detect than others, um, but, but those were the, the primary ones uh, that came as a result of this survey. Um, the presence of anti-fraud controls is associated with reduced fraud losses or a shorter fraud duration. So just, in, just by the fact that you might have some internal controls in place isn't necessarily going to prevent something from happening, but usually they can be detected a little bit quicker uh, than if you didn't have any in place at all or if you had uh, you know, one person doing a lot of the different things within your organization. Um, I'm sure some of you have uh, been aware of some of the different one, different dealerships frauds that have been widely publicized. Uh, I had a few examples here that, that I was just going to share with you. Um, at a dealership down in Texas, and, and this was actually relatively small in comparison to some other ones that I've been associated with, about $12,000 was stolen. Uh, the individual was just taking cash and not depositing it into the dealership's bank account. It's pretty simple fraud. Um, there was a Ford dealership in California. A uh, 13-year employee of a Ford dealership is accused of embezzling more than $100,000 over a significant period of time. Uh, the whole staff and management were surprised that this happened. Uh, the, the individual who was being interviewed said, the staff we worked with basically said she was very respected and dedicated employee to the organization. And again, the cases that I've been involved with personally, it's always been, you know, that would be the last person that you would expect that would ever commit fraud against the organization. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always uh, the, the person that would completely shock you. Uh, another fraud that occurred, office manager uh, handled accounting, payroll, banking, and other financial functions, giving him free reign across the dealership, cost his employer an average of $100,000 a year for 14 years. Uh, too much trust and not enough internal controls printed, proved to be a disastrous combination for this dealership. Uh, another dealership, and this one some of you might have heard of because uh, it was around $10 million. Uh, former dealership controller sold an average of $4,000 a day for seven years and used it to finance the lifestyle of the rich and famous. Um, she too was trusted and had complete control without oversight. So, you know, that's just a, a, a few examples. Um, and, and, and again, th these dealerships are going to be in the minority, you know, uh, with regards to, you know, the total dealership population. Uh, but none of these people where this fraud occurred, you know, none of these dealers thought, hey, that would never happen to me. And, and they start, had to deal with some of these things. Um, prevention is cheaper than recovery. So uh, one of the big things is, even if you've got insurance to cover uh, this, a lot of times they don't cover uh, the investigation cost and the cost of the lawsuits and everything else associated with doing it. Uh, incomplete recovery, if at all, um, most of the time, like in the case of the person who was taking the $4,000 a day from the dealership, she'd spent all the money. So there was nothing left really to recover. You might have a few cars or you know, maybe a house or something that you can recover. But realistically, most of the hard assets are going to get you pennies on the dollar of what was taken. Uh, just the negative pu publicity in and of itself. Uh, you know, a lot of times, and, and this is across the board, this isn't just with dealerships, uh, people will not prosecute fraud because they don't want the negative publicity for their company, which is understandable. Um, so, you know, doing something on the, the forefront to try to prevent it is much cheaper, a le lot less headache than having to deal with a lot of the ramifications of having somebody, uh, you know, take from you. Well, you know, one of the things a lot of times people wonder, it's like, well, you know, why did they do this? What motivated them to, uh, to go into this, uh, you know, lifestyle of, you know, stealing? You know, this person was a trusted employee or this person, you know, had grandkids or kids and, you know, we did stuff with them personally and it's like, I just don't understand what would uh, prompt somebody to do this. Uh, you know, there's different studies out here. This one is the, is the fraud triangle. Many of you may have heard of this already. 
Uh, motivation, a lot of times can be financial pressures, uh, different vices. They can have gambling addictions. They can have drug addictions. They could be going through a divorce. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things. Prescription drugs, all, all kinds of different uh, areas could potentially cause them to do that. Justification, um, a lot of times it's workplace perception. If, if they say, hey, you know what, I, I see the person, you know, some other people here are making more money than I am, you know, I should be making more. So, so they'll find a way to justify it in some way, shape, or form. Um, feelings of being treated unfairly, if they're the ones uh, that are writing checks sometimes or, or, or doing some different things or, or they just have access to it, uh, they say, you know what, I'm get, I don't really feel like I'm getting a fair shake here, so, you know, I'm going to justify it that way. Uh, also, the perceived odds of getting away with it. Um, a lot of times that in and of itself uh, can be a big factor. If they think, you know, nobody's really looking at me, nobody's going to know if I do this or not, uh, that in and of itself can be a w uh, another way that, that people would want to commit fraud. So um, if you identify system weaknesses, if the payoff exceeds the perceived risk for somebody, they're like, you know, uh, most of the time, these people don't get prosecuted. I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, and try it and see if, if I can get away with it. Uh, and a lot of times, successful small frauds will build confidence. So if somebody you know, does one thing and they try one transaction, nobody catches it in the system. They'll go through and try another one maybe a month later. Nobody catches that one. It'll start getting a little bit more uh, frequent, and the, the dollar amounts tend to get a little bit higher. Uh, keys to preventing fraud. Uh, obviously, having a healthy anti-fraud anti environment helps. Uh, interim controls also help, so we're going to hit on those just a little bit. Um, having a healthy anti-fraud environment, uh, some of the, the keys here, uh, a lot of the cues from the, the people that are committing these frauds are taken from the top. So if, if upper management or, or the dealers are not, they, they don't have a good tone at the top as far as, you know, how, you know, is management honest? Do they... Uh, act with integrity with employees, with customers, things like that? Uh, do they have a zero tolerance policy regarding fraud? And has that been communicated to the employees? A lot of times, you know, people are just silent about it. They don't talk about it. And so, you know, nobody really thinks about it. And when it happens, it's like, well, wait a second, I never really talked about it with anybody. But, but if you're doing that and you're, you're saying, hey, you know, if, if this happens within my organization, it's like we are going to prosecute, we're going to do these different things. You know, having that tone from upper management makes a big difference. Um, do you have an effective fraud reporting system in place? Uh, if you have employees that may suspect fraud is occurring, uh, do they have the opportunity they feel comfortable coming to you and reporting that to you? And if you, and if you don't, that needs to be communicated to your employees to say, hey, you know, I, you know employee meetings, whatever, it's like if, if anybody suspects anything you know, dishonest is going on in my organization, I want you to come to me. I'm, I'm the top here and I'll take care of it. Um, training employees and fraud awareness, that goes along with that. Um, do employees know where to seek advice when, pay, when faced with potential fraud or ethical decisions? Um, and again, do they feel like they can speak, speak freely with management or do they have, are they fearful of that? Uh, do your employees feel respected and supported? Uh, are employees support support programs available at your dealership to assist employees struggling with addictions, emotional issues, and family or financial problems. So a lot of times if you know somebody is, is struggling with something or you've seen it or you've heard from some of your other employees, are you doing anything to help them with that? Because a lot of times that can lead them into doing things that they wouldn't normally do uh, under normal circumstances. Uh, do employees feel comfortable uh, accessing such assistance if it's available? Do they feel like they're going to get fired even if you did have something in place and they say, hey, I'm really struggling with uh, depression or, you know, uh, emotional issues or, you know, drug addiction or whatever it is. It's like, do they feel that they could do it without retribution? So uh, that's just some of the different areas. Um, and, and these are important, but again, they're, they're not going to be really sufficient without having good internal controls in place. So uh, as part of the survey that we did, um, how would you describe the controls you have in place to prevent or deter fraud? Again, this was from the survey that we did of the 100 respondents. 18% um, said we have some oversight with decent checks and balances. We had 54% say we have a solid system, but we might have room for improvement, just not sure where. And then 28% of the respondents said, hey, things are locked down tight. Nobody could ever get away with doing anything here. I'll tell you, some of the people that I've dealt with thought that 28%. Uh, they were in that 28%. They said, hey, you know, we've got things locked down tight. There's no way anybody could take anything here. And then they ended up being a victim. So 
Uh, that Again, that was from our survey. Some primary control methods that we've got up here, I'm just gonna roll out a couple of them. Proper segregation of duties is probably the biggest thing. Uh, again, if you have one person doing too much within your dealership, it's not a good thing. Uh, or if you have one, and a lot of times you don't really think about it, because it's like, well, you know, my person does this stuff and, and they do a good job and they give me my financials at the end of the month. And that's great, and you need that. Um, but are there checks and balances in place to make sure that, that you know, that person isn't the only one looking at some of this stuff? Uh, some of your cash handling procedures, you know, do you have proper segregation of duties in place there and, you know, one person isn't taking things to the bank that's actually taking the money from the customers? Treasury controls, check signing, wire transfers, are you guys aware of what your controls are in place at your bank? Uh, ACH fraud, uh, wire transfer fraud has been hugely uh, prevalent. It's probably one of the primary ways I've seen a lot of people take money uh, out of companies' accounts. Uh, through the treasury controls because a lot of times the owners just don't understand uh, what they have in place and what they don't have in place with the banks. Uh, authorization procedures, actual physical safeguards of assets, uh, job rotations, mandatory vacations. Uh, I've seen some companies that it's like, yeah, we require you know somebody to take a mandatory vacation, but we make sure she does her job before she leaves and nobody does it while she's gone and she comes back and she does it because it's like it's payroll and it's confidential or something like that. So yeah, I mean, mandatory vacations are good as long as somebody else is doing the job uh, when they're gone. So uh, again, just, just to touch on some of the different control methods that are up there. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom Wolf now. Tom works in our Columbus office. He's on our dealership services group. He's gonna talk to you a little bit about our um, SAFE program that we have, Secure Automotive Financial Environment and uh, just some of the things that we can do to come out and help your dealership, you know, kind of look at some of these systems that I've been talking about and, uh, and assist you in helping to improve your engine remote controls. Thank you, Randy. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about SAFE. And, you know, going back to Randy's presentation, I mean, now that you've all seen how, how prevalent fraud is out in the, in the dealership world, hopefully none of you have had to deal with it personally. But if you have, um, looking at some of Randy's statistics, it is very prevalent. So we do have a solution for you. I mean, I didn't want to, we didn't want to scare you with all these statistics and not give you solutions. So SAFE is Secure Automotive Financial Environment. And I think what SAFE really speaks to, and I think our audience here can appreciate this, is the dealers and the upper management of the dealership. Going back to Randy's slide upon, uh, that talked about what a really healthy anti-fraud environment is, and that starts with the tone at the top. Employees need to see that the owners and the management care about what doing things right um, and holding people accountable. Um, yeah, employees might feel like you're looking over their shoulder, but they do want to see that you're holding them accountable and care about doing things the right way. So SAFE is what we've kind of come up with to kind of um, assist the dealer in achieving those goals. Um, it really does help set the tone at the top. A lot of the dealerships that we work with, a lot of the folks in this room, don't have huge accounting departments. So you can't have the great segregation of controls that like the public companies might have. You might only have one or two or three people in the accounting department, so you can't have that segregation of controls. You need something else to help bolster your internal controls and hold people accountable, and that's where SAFE comes in. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more. I'll give you a, some uh, background just about Brady Ware and the, and the dealership folks. We are based uh, in our northern three offices here. We do have an office in Atlanta as well, but our dealership folks are based in Columbus State and in Richmond. Uh, we've got two directors, uh, Sam Agresti and Mike Stover, and myself, uh, actually Randy, and myself and Kelly Whitty as managers in the dealership services group, and we have a total of 10 team members that we work with that service our dealership clients in this truly unique area of expertise, as I'm sure you all know. The dealership world is, um, ever-changing and so there's a lot of stuff to keep up with so we um, have a dedicated team for that. So going back to SAFE and talking about how it you know, can prevent and, and detect fraud, I think it also does a lot of things and I'll talk about um, some of the specific modules, but um, it can help your, improve your cash flow, your profitability, as well as bolstering and checking on your internal controls as well. So um, a lot of folks know, you know, hey, I'm having a problem with F&I, I'm having a problem with collecting receivables, or I'm not sure about my cash disbursements or controls over journal entries. Those are some very common areas where we see uh, dealers and clients that have some concerns. So um, some people know exactly where they want us to focus on in some specific area. 
otherwise, we can do a dealership-wide assessment that is going to um, start at a 60,000-foot view. We'll do some analysis, um, run some numbers, and then maybe we can come back to you and say, you know, this is a couple areas where we think you could use uh, our safe procedures to, to help bolster things. Um, and, and then it gives you a, an ability to kind of pick and choose from a menu what you want to do. If you want to do one module or ten modules, whatever it might be. Um, and that's kind of what our, uh, our approach has been in terms of in implementing com a complete program or just a series of, um, of uh, procedures. Like I said, it's flexible and we've broken our, um, uh, our procedures down into several different areas. Banking and cash is a very popular one. Uh, cash disbursements, cash receipts. Um, making sure that we, we will test a lot of transactions in those areas to tell you, okay, here's what the, the controls should be. Are they being met? Do you have dual signatures on the checks? We'll actually select the transactions, follow them all the way through to actually who cashes the check, who, gets, who, who is endorsed to on the back of the check. And we come back to you with those results. We can test 10 transactions. We can test 100. That's kind of how you know, it can all be part of the, uh, the menu and, and how you want to approach it, where you think you want to focus on. Like I said, bank reconciliations, we can test those as well to make sure those are being done. Unfortunately, there's a lot of dealerships in, across the country that probably aren't up to date on their bank reconciliations. Um, a lot of times we recommend dealers get their bank statements at their home, flip through the bank statements before they bring them in to the office manager controller to be reconciled. Um, Payables and receivables, a lot of this is going to be focused on receivables, and this is where more of the profitability and cash flow comes into play. Um, we get a lot of calls from dealers that say, you know, I'm making $100,000 every month, but I have no cash. Well, where's the cash tied up? It's in receivables. Uh, maybe there's a problem in F&I, so we take a deal from beginning to end, follow it all the way through the process, how long it gets t takes to get collected, what bank it went through, um, who the finance manager was, who the salesperson was. Um, even look at the deal to make sure there weren't any additional fees charged that could affect your profitability as well that weren't set up in the original deal. Um, inventory and sales. Um, vehicle inventory. Most of the cars are floor planned, obviously, but we do have a, a, a set of procedures that can go through and make sure and track your inventory. Um, a lot of clients that we ask to say, uh, our floor plan, well, our, all our cars are on floor plan, so I don't need to worry about that. Well, there's a lot of used cars that aren't floor plan. Have you, how do you track them? How do you make sure they're not um, you know, disappearing and things like that? So parts is another one that's very popular. It's a whole separate department with its own accounting system that's not really tied into the main accounting system. And so parts can off, obviously walk out the back door a lot. And so there's, there needs to be good controls about around the parts department as well so we can test controls and, um, and procedures in that area as well. Other things such as expense analysis or under the accounting issues, sales, sales and use tax is a huge issue. I'm sure a lot of folks have had to deal with that uh, with the state of Ohio or whichever the st uh, state they might be in. Expense analysis, like I said, benchmarking. Journal entries, um, another huge area. Typically, if you're going to commit fraud uh, in a dealership, you're going to have to post a journal entry to cover up what you did. Um, so the testing and, of review and approval of journal entries is very important as well. Um, a, a very popular set of procedures that we've, we've done. So review and approval of journal entries. And then we've also got some departmental reviews in F&I department and body shop as well that we um, can do. So it's really a menu pricing and menu format that you know, dealers can pick and choose what they want to focus on. And if not, we can kind of do an analysis to help them find uh, what areas might be key for their dealership. So, My name is Mike Stover. I'm a uh, partner in our Dayton office. Uh, I work with the dealer services team and uh, service clients in Western Ohio and uh, Kentucky. Uh, as Jim so eloquently told us, there are a lot of people looking to take your business. Uh, and unfortunately, some of those people actually work for you. Uh, besides the uh, routine year-end accounting and tax services that we provide to our clients. We are also now making available our auditors and certified fraud examiner uh, to test your system of internal controls proactively to stop those employees from also trying to take your business. Uh, and we would love the opportunity to work for you.